Maria Letivni, hello, good morning. It's a pleasure to have you. Delighted to be with you. You have a strong background in uh, international finance and even banking, and you're the director of the FAIR initiative. We will discuss uh, that uh, at length in a moment. But uh, I think at that stage, it's enough to say, if I'm not mistaken, that it's a global network of investors who agree to focus on uh, animal production and the impact on uh, our life. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. So we've been around for about three years now. We were founded by Jeremy Collar, who is the founder and CIO of, of Collar Capital. Um, and he had always had uh, an interest in um, the global food system and the risks um, of intensive animal production. And so really he decided that, you know, one of the ways that he could sort of fast track his impact, um, other than moving forward through um, the work he was doing at his foundation was really to focus on um, the investor community and how investors can engage in this sector. And so FAIR was born in, in 2015. And so we've been around for about three years now. Thank you. My first question to you, uh, Maria, would be what does public value mean to you as a citizen and to FAIR? Yeah, so I mean, public value, I think, can mean a lot of things. But when I, you know, upon thinking about it, I really thought, well, it's really sort of an encompassing, holistic, societal, communal, um, environmental, economic value received, or maybe even destroyed, I suppose, by, you know, industry, corporate, um, government, or even us as, as individuals. And I think, you know, this idea of public value is really growing now because we're really sort of interconnected um, this this ecosystem in which we live and our actions both through their direct impacts and and, e and even through how these act the messages that these actions communicate um, to stakeholders about trust about um, inclusivity and the right to like an equitable and even sustainable world are becoming even even more and more important so yeah a really holistic view of of how our inter interconnectedness plays out in terms of, um, you know, just transition, inclusivity, and, and equity. Thank you. Uh, you. You focus on the investment, as you said. Um, for us, uh, responsible investors are really important because we believe that they're the, the, they have the best leverage to change the world in, um, in a way. What's your, your vision and how do you function with them? Yeah, I mean, I think this term responsible investor is now becoming a bit obsolete, right? I think the, the market's beginning to realize that sustainability is a responsibility and all investors have a responsibility to be good stewards of their capital, right? It's not just about profit above everything else, which is um, a growing trend. So we, you know, at FAIR bring together institutional investors as part of our a member network to really, again, use their influence as active stewards of capital to begin to change um, industry for, for the better, or at least to, to do less harm. Yeah, um, if we take the UN Global Compact data, or the KPMG data, it's all over globally 10% of the global corporations that really care about addressing the needs of society and the environment. It also means that over 90% of them do not care yet. And I was told many times that among the investors, it was almost the same proportion. Is it your, uh, your perception as well? Or do you think it is really growing among institutional investors or or family investors? What's your perception? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, for family investors, sustainability is certainly certainly growing because it's definitely a, a topic that future generations are concerned about. And we're seeing that even through consumer habits. Um, with institutional investors, I think there's now a real realization that these sort of sustainability factors or ESG factors, um, which again, previously had been, you know, sort of sitting in this responsible investment community, are actually very material. And there's a need to understand um, the potential environmental and social risks because they can actually impact the long-term value of, of investment portfolios. And so it's really about changing this mindset about sort of lumping these 
risks and opportunity into something that, you know, sits on the sidelines and isn't core to operational risk. And that's absolutely changing at almost breakneck speed. Yeah, so this 10% um, share is, is growing. Yes, that's your, your perspective. Yeah, I mean, look, if the 10% is growing under the context of, you know, are these material risks to the operation of certain businesses? Again, you know, we would want to look at the factors that are important for, you know, different co companies in different sectors. So if it's material and meaningful, then absolutely. Yes, it's absolutely growing. What I've uh, found really interesting in the FAIR initiative is that you are bringing uh, uh, a very concrete uh, path to understanding how we could manage uh, change in one particular industrial sector. And with your uh, methodology and your index, you're actually uh, raising awareness not only about the risk in the um, in the in the food uh, uh, sector, in the protein uh, subsector, prote protein production subsector, but also how it can be changed. Would you tell us a few words about your uh, index, please? Yeah. So last year, um, Fair published something called the Color Fair Protein Producer Index, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and what we what we did, I mean, this comes from. I mean, I joined Fair about two and a half years ago, and you know, we obviously, the team had been talking about factory farming and intensive livestock producers and, you know, how this industry needed to, to be needed intervention and all that is absolutely true. But one of the things that, you know, I felt was very important is, you know, who are these factory farmers? And so when we go out to investors and we say, hey, you need to really be managing these risks, we also needed to have a really good understanding of who these operators or these producers, uh, suppliers of meat, fish, and dairy for the global, you know, for the entire world were. And so we decided this, it was essential that we embarked on this, on this project. And what we did is we identified the 60 largest listed meat, fish, and dairy producers globally, which frankly um, only makes up about 25% of the entire um, meat, fish, and dairy production market because of how um, the industry is structured. But nevertheless, I mean, these are the companies that most investors have in their portfolios. And what we thought we'd do is take again, um, a, to look through the ESG lens and see how these companies were actually managing environment and social risks across their operations. And so we looked at ESG risk factors like greenhouse gas emissions or de deforestation and biodiversity um, management and water scarcity and water use, working conditions, waste and water pollution, food safety, the things that you would expect companies that were producing meat um, at large scale to be able to manage um, so that, you know, the end product, which is the meat um, that comes to your supermarkets, um, you know, would be uh, produced in a way that's not doing more damage than adding value. Uh, and certainly what, what we found with our analysis was um, some, some pretty shocking uh, results. Now, you know, we found that there wasn't a whole lot of publicly available information about how these companies were managing risk um, across these nine risk factors. And in fact, um, investors absolutely needed to be aware and engaged um, with these companies in order to ensure that um, we were safeguarding not only human health, but, but the environment and natural resources. Yes, you altogether have nine risks. These are the risks we can relate to. Yes, we as citizens or consumers, we care about uh, water, but also the use of antibiotics. This is one of those issues that I think um, the capital markets wasn't really focusing on before uh, three years ago when we started um, FAIR. Um, and most people actually don't know that the majority of the world's antibiotics actually goes into the food system. Not, it's not distributed through, you know, our doctors and nurses through the human health system, but actually is given to perfectly healthy animals um, in the food system in order to prop up, um, a, a, you know, a livestock farming system um, that is, you know, typically not very well ventilated um, and is ripe with disease given the quantity of animals that are, are placed in, in, you know, 
in these different farms. And so antibiotics is in the current system absolutely needed in order to maintain the health of these animals. As a result, they're given small doses of antibiotics every single day in their food and water, which means that naturally occurring bacteria in these systems are becoming resistant. And that resistance actually has the ability to transfer, transfer to humans, making humans actually resistant to certain types of antibiotics, um, which could be absolutely, obviously, catastrophic um, as, as antibiotic resistance grows um, through the animal and, and human health circles. So this is something that we've been working very hard on for, um, well, at FAIR for the past three years, and even Jeremy through his foundation for the previous three. So it's an absolutely critical issue that for investors um, should be sort of front of mind. Yes, we are raising awareness and it's scary, as you mentioned. Um, what would be the alternative? We don't have it yet. We don't have any alternative to, to that uh, use or abuse of antibiotics. Oh, the, well, I mean, there's actually a lot of alternatives. Um, you know, a lot of there's um, some producers are using probiotics. Um, there's vaccines in the market. I mean, one of the biggest one of the biggest challenges to, to the industry is also there's just not enough incentive for pharmaceutical companies to begin producing new antibiotics. Um, it's extremely costly. Um, and so the, you know, the continued use of normal medically important antibiotics seems, you know, it's very hard to curb because these large industries, which are extremely powerful, um, are using them. And obviously to the benefit of a pharmaceutical companies who now, when you are looking at these generically produced um, antibiotics, it's, it's a volume business, right? So there needs to be some kind of incentivization or um, proper valuing of, of you know, the underlying asset, if you will, the animal or the meat in order to move away from the use of antibiotics, right? Because you know, any change in production naturally equates to some kind of increase in capital expenditure or perhaps increase in cost at the, at, the, um, at the end product. And certainly the excuse to date has been, you know, any increase in cost would have to be absorbed by the consumer. But, um, and that's not necessarily the case, right? We, we certainly know that it's, it's a marginal increase in cost to be able to safeguard, um, you know, potentially $10 trillion of lost economic output or, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives, which can be lost annually to something like antibiotic resistance, which we know is occurring and we certainly have the ability to mitigate. Hmm. It's, a care, it's a pretty scary situation. It's one of those where the more you know, the more, the more you maybe don't want to know. And the more you become vegan, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I mean, interesting you say that, but vegans are not immune, right? So the transference of antibiotic resistance um, is not because you're eating the meat. It's bacteria that's naturally in our air um, that we are, you know, transform that, you know, transferring just in normal sort of communicable situations. So, um, unfortunately, just becoming vegan won't uh, won't protect you from this one. Oh well. <laughs> Let's go to a more positive topic. Uh, <laughs> and, and I take you back to how you came up with this. Uh, uh, nine risks yes. because that was a multi-stakeholder conversation as well. I read that you were talking to investors, but also civil society actors. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, when you know, when you want to produce any new product, I mean, for us, it, it makes absolutely no sense to uh, recreate the wheel, right? So, in many of our risk factors, there were already very well-established metrics and KPIs that both corporates and investors were using. So for example, um, on topics like greenhouse gas emissions, there were many corporates that were already reporting to CDP, which is a global platform which um, asked corporates to report on topics like greenhouse gas emissions or deforestation or water. Um, and there was other resource uh, research organizations currently um, you know, out in the capital markets that were already engaging with investors and corporates that had established some really great metrics. So on deforestation, you know, there was already spot. Um, on, you know, on water, there were other um, organizations besides CDP, such as Ceres or China Water Risk. 
And so we really tried to um, aggregate the best practice KPIs that we'd already established that were already established in the market, so that investors didn't see any duplicity. Corporates didn't think, okay, here's another reporting framework. I'm going to have to, you know, totally revamped my, my reporting structure or my internal data in order to report. So we really wanted to hone in on the major ESG risk factors that were already established in the market that were um, relevant to this sector. And again, engage across the board with um, already established organizations that were working on these issues to make sure that we were aligned on all sides, where those KPIs or key performance indicators were uh, were relevant to the risk factors that we were looking at. So um, you, you got some help from civil society as well. Did you ask citizens what they care about, what the, the, the risks are for them or? No, I mean, we didn't. I mean, our focus really is on institutional investors. And so we would tap into sort of that in our network to say, does this make sense to you? Um, but we do follow consumer trends. So we follow, I mean, uh, because it really does affect how we're going to see corporates respond. Um, and, you know, certainly we have seen consumers begin to understand the risks of antibiotic resistance and buying antibiotic free meat. We're seeing millennials care about the carbon footprint of the food that, they're, um, that they buy in the store. Um, you know, we're seeing a trend towards flexitarianism or, you know, away from meat, because there is this understanding of, um, you know, the negative impacts of, you know, large or overconsumption of meat can have on not only human health, but the environment. So we follow those trends, um, but, but we don't reach out to um, individuals to, to get a sense check on where, where we're going with our strategy. What do you think the next step uh, is for <clears throat> a global uh, network of investors like, uh, like yours? Uh, where do you take them? Well, I think, I mean, our role, I feel like, is to increasingly raise awareness of the material financial risks. And so what we want investors to do is to take our practical tools, our research, and begin to, to integrate it into, into their investment process to really understand the risk associated with each one of those risk factors and, be, and begin to adapt their models. Um, and, you know, we hope change their portfolio weightings based on the new information that we have. I mean, I think what the market now understands is there's a real lack of good quality data to begin to make sensible decisions. I mean, there's a lot of data now, whereas maybe 10 years ago, there wasn't so much around these issues. And now there's a lot. And it's just a meet. We need to be able to sift through that to, to be able to assess which data is really meaningful to us, um, which is the most accurate, and how investors can begin to use that in their, in their portfolio process. And so it's really up to FAIR, I, I believe, our responsibilities to help investors meet those challenges. Um, and that's our core core focus to help them engage with companies to move them in the right direction. So the way you will, uh, you will uh, measure your own impact, the impact of the FAIR initiative is going to be vis-a-vis -vis the investors rather than vis-a-vis -vis the corporates, yes? No, I mean, we, I mean, I, we certainly, we engage through the investors, but we do measure, our, well, we, to the extent that we can, for example, with our antibiotics engagement, which has been going for three years now, when that engagement started three years ago, we had 1.1 trillion um, of investors engaging with 10 uh, fast food companies. And at that point in time, there was not even one company really had a meaningful policy around antibiotic use, nor did they even kind of know what kinds of things they needed to be doing in order to really answer investors' requests around policies around antibiotic use in the livestock supply chain. Three years later, we now engage with 20 companies, and 19 out of the 20 companies have a policy um, and a strategy to reduce antibiotic use in their supply chains. Um, and some are even moving to actually measuring the quantity of antibiotics used in their supply chain. So, we certainly measure impact on things like our collaborative engagements, where we're asking companies a set of questions and then monitoring progress over time. 
Um, and we'll continue to do that at FAIR, but certainly what we want to see, and it's beginning to happen, um, you know, is a, an intervention in the global food system, an actual intervention in a sector that has been left to its own devices for decades, which is the large global um, intensive meat producers, um, and see them kind of start to scramble a little bit to stay ahead of the game, right, to stay competitive. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that happen even with large, you know, large meat producers like Tyson and Cargill and others who, you know, had previously sort of brushed off this plant-based protein movement and now are actually investing in a meaningful way to make sure that they have a stake um, in, you know, in this sort of revolution that we're seeing in the, in the food system. It's actually really, you know, a very positive um, and rapidly expanding um, trend. It is very interesting indeed. And also um, uh, very positive because a lot of uh, people feel totally overwhelmed with this uh, challenge of going from where we stand towards a more sustainable world, <clears throat> particularly when we see how fast the population is growing on our planet and how fast we destroy it. So that's actually why we came to you to show that focusing on one particular sector, the food sector, and even on a subsector can have a tremendous impact. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of stories to tell, actually, to reach out to the consumer. Yeah, there's plenty of stories to tell. I mean, and we're seeing consumers being impacted in, you know, various ways. I mean, governments are changing sort of dietary um, requirements for, you know, in different markets, which is great. I mean, previously when I grew up in the U.S., you know, I had my four food groups and, you know, and dairy played a large part of that. And, you know, meat was a key component. And you're even seeing the framing of, of sort of dietary recommendations from governments change. I mean, even in places like Canada and France, right? You know, even you know, even France, who you know is a large meat meat consumer, now encouraging you know eating of more legumes, um, and all that's you know very positive. Is this realization of you know we don't need to be eating a you know a heavily um, meat and dairy diet, um, and you know we're seeing the consumer. Trends, uh, you know, play out that way too. I mean, even in places like North America, which is a big meat consumer, you know, we are seeing trends that say moving towards more flexitarian diets, eating an increased amount of plants, plant-based protein. Um, you know, places like the UK um, and even Asia. I mean, it's it's actually tremendous. I was in the U.S. now two weeks ago, and I was. I mean, we obviously monitor these trends and we know it's happening, but you know, if you, I was in California and every single fast food restaurant was promoting a plant-based product, but not just had it on the menu, as you'd think 10 years ago, if you, but they were having giant billboards on the freeway. I mean, it was the, absolutely the thing they were promoting. I mean, from, you know, Burger King to Carl's Jr. to, you know, to, Del Taco, you know, the Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger are the hottest trend. Um, and it's actually what's improving their margins. And we actually saw that here in the UK too with Greg's and their, um, and their, what is it, their sausage roll that they came out with last year. It's one of the fastest growing products that they have, you know, so it's, it's actually just taken the whole consumer market by storm and turning into real increases in profit margin, which is what, which is what we want to see. That's really fascinating. Thank you, Maya. Uh, as we are approaching to the end of our interview, and we also mentioned uh, the overwhelming uh, task, what is your very first uh, advice to a new investor who comes to join your, your network and feels a bit overwhelmed with this uh, uh, ESG uh, approach? Well, I mean, I think our role as FAIR is to make it not so overwhelming. And one of the things I think investors, um, you know, need to do as you would at any time in any approach with ESG is to start to think about sort of investment philosophy and, and investment beliefs and how 
this sector may align with sort of delivering for beneficiaries um, and, and help that process, right? They're, the food system, as we've just discussed, has you know, positive and negative impacts. And many you know, global asset owners have themes which are directly related to this sector and how those can be connected and deliver for value for beneficiaries is I think, you know, a very nice starting point. Um, and then, you know, that's what FAIR is here for. We are, we're here to make um, the integration of these risk factors and opportunities easy for investors. And, you know, that's our number one goal. And I think that's why we've been so successful. And so, you know, I would just encourage them to think about where their exposures are um, in their own portfolios. Um, we now cover 107 companies at FAIR, and so certainly there must be some overlap in that we can make the sort of transition into thinking about the global food system really part of the, a key theme for investors. Oh. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much. That was uh, very interesting and extremely concrete too. I'm, uh, I'm grateful for your time and uh, your sharing. I'm delighted to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you.